in the book of Isaiah, and um, Isaiah is writing. Um, it's it's always amazing how the like whenever people that these prophets can foresee and, and see out into the future, but you know it's okay. To God, it's all knowledge. God doesn't see into the future. He doesn't remember the past. It's all knowledge. So the, the prophets, you know, like John in the book of Revelation or Isaiah here, does he, does he actually, you know, go forward in the, and God has a, a screen that he shows him the picture, this is what it's going to be like, or does he receive the impression from God that this is what's going to happen? And uh, that, you know, these are the promises. And they hear something or see that which is entirely different than what you would imagine. You can't imagine that um, there's going to be a coming Messiah and then the invitation to accept or reject him. That's what the scripture is here. And then the new Jerusalem, the new, you know, the thousand year millennial reign of Christ and uh, the new Jerusalem and all that. And, and, And Isaiah sees this. And he talks about it, and he writes about it. And we see it in the book of Revelation, and it's the same, the same message that John gives is, a, is, sim, is the sim, same message that Isaiah gives. And it's like they're looking at the same picture. <laughs> they're receiving the same revelation. And so when we start to put this together, we find that God is at work in each of these situations, whether it's in Isaiah's time period or whether it's in uh, John uh, in the book of Revelation on the Isle of Patmos, whether it's in that time period or whether it's in our time period, God is at work in all of these things and he's giving us an understanding, which we studied in um, Ephesians, that God gives us the revelation of his will uh, with all wisdom and understanding. So uh, we, we, we get to look at this and see the, the hand of God in, in, in many ways. So as we look at here in uh, chapter 61, today's lesson, Isaiah presents the Messiah in a variety of roles. So we see in 61, 62, and 65, we have those are the three chapters that we look at. Uh, First, he is seen as the Redeemer uh, through his finished work of redemption, through salvation, through the work of the cross, Um, being that he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Um, not only is he the Lamb of God, but he is also the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Uh, when he come back to earth, uh, not the suffering servant, but as King of kings and Lord of lords. So Isaiah sees this taking place. Now, <clears throat> if you're seeing this take place or the revelation of it take place, you know, it's like you would be stuck on that wow, on that scene. That, but then it moves on to the next scene. And then the next scene is different than the third scene. And it's like, well, which one of these is right? Well, they're all right. But whenever you're receiving, you know, if you're receiving the revelation as Isaiah is, you know, it's like, well, uh, these are different, but, uh, uh, you know, how can they be different? You know, <laughs> if we would look into, the, look into the future and, you know, and be able to say this is going to happen, this is going to happen, that's going to happen, you'd look at it and say, well, they don't go along with each other. <laughs> In this case, they do. So the second, um, in Isaiah 62, that the Messiah is also seen as the rewarder of those who faithfully follow him. So there is a, um, um, a, a way in which, the, the, you know, the, the, in the uh, judgment seat of Christ, where all the righteous are rewarded for what they have done, you know, for Christ. Only that which is done for Christ will last. And also we have the, um, the idea of, in Revelation, we have the seven churches and um, the rewards and the outcomes uh, given to them. That shows Jesus in, t- in this par- particular place. Um, that he, Jesus, in this section, he is capable of keeping every promise in, um, in his love of reward, in his love of rewarders, in his role, excuse me, in his role of rewarder, he will make... Um, distinction between the sheep and the goats, the good and the bad, and will, re- and will reward according to the works. Okay, So we have that, now remember, the scripture talks about how that um, by grace you're saved through faith, not of works. So we're saved by grace, 
But the message of God is that the work of God is to be carried out in our life, and so we are to carry on the work, and we will be rewarded according to what the work that we have done for, for Christ. And then the third section is the Messiah will be seen as the Prince of Peace. Before his death and resurrection, Jesus promised his disciples, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. So every believer then is promised this peace of God that passes all understanding. Um, so we experience this place of peace is actually thinking of or going to that uh, thousand year millennial reign of Christ in which Christ will reign and there'll be the peace upon the earth. So that's kind of the jumping ahead of what these three divisions of our lesson are. And the first division is in the coming of the Messiah, Isaiah 61, verses 1, 2, and 3. Um, it starts out by saying, the, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Now, as um, Isaiah sees the Lord here, it, uh, he's kind of looking down, as the, I like the, the, cor the um, commentary says, as Isaiah sees uh, looking down a corridor of time. <laughs> that's, a, that's a nice figurative language. Looking down the corridor of time um, and seeing the coming of the Messiah, Christ came to bring good news to the poor, who made up the large number of those who followed him. He uh, presented a joyful message to those who um, bore the oppression of poverty, the message of healing of the broken heart. But we also find that the Messiah came to bring deliverance to those who were held captive, and that he was there to those who were held captive by their sin and facing the judgment of God. These wonderful works were accomplished by the preaching of the gospel and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now, when Jesus quoted this scripture whenever he was reading it, he stopped at, uh, to proclaim the acceptable year of our Lord. It's chapter, verse 2 of that. Because that was, that was the division between the first part and the second part of, those, of, those, uh, of that revelation. Because the second part of that revelation goes to another time. So when Jesus read this, he read what was applicable to him at that time period, and then the rest of it he didn't read because it wasn't applicable to him there, but it would be applicable at the, at the uh, millennial reign of Christ. So, um, so when the, the focus in Isaiah 2, where the focus turns to his second coming, his message for the second advent, his vengeance and, uh, uh, and comfort. So... He, you know, the wicked the judgment at the great white, excuse me, at the battle of Armageddon and the, you know, bringing vengeance and judgment upon the world and the wickedness. So he will bring comfort to all who mourn in Israel. He will bestow a crown of beauty for ashes and turn their sighing into singing and musing into music and sadness into gladness and all tears into triumph. So that's a different time period than what he was reading of and what he was uh, put down here as uh, the first part, that uh, he was coming as this anointed Messiah. And then uh, the second part here is the priesthood of all believers. And I, I, I printed out the, um, the verses that they skip here. The, the section in our lesson goes from chapter 61, 4 to 7, but it only, it only uh, lists verse 6. And so verse, verse 4, it says, Then the old cities that were destroyed will be rebuilt. Those ancient ruins will be made new as they were in the beginning. Then your enemies will come to care for your, your sheep, and their children will work in your fields and in, the, and in your gardens. 
and then verse 8, verse 6, excuse me, of our lesson, you will be called the Lord's priests, the servants of our God. You will, be, you will be proud of all the riches that have come to you from all the nations on earth. And then verse 7, in the past, the other people shamed you and said bad things to you. You were shamed much more than any other people. So in your land, you will get two times more than other people. You will get the joy that continues forever. So uh, the mourners of verse 3 become the repairers of verse 4. <laughs> All right? The mourners of verse 3 say that, um, uh, which we read up here earlier, those in Zion who mourn, I will take away their ashes and their he from their heads, and I will give them a crown, take away their sadness, and give them joy of happiness. So the ones who are there have come to, the ones who are mourners are the ones who are the rebuilders. And um, this will not be the case during the, excuse me, this will not be the case during the millennial reign of Christ. During that period, Israel will rebuild and re um, reunite cities and the people will watch them rise again. So it's talking about, okay, Isaiah sees a couple of things going on here that um, the, the priesthood of believers, and ye shall be named priests of the Lord, that's verse 6, and uh, you are the Lord's priests. So whenever Israel in this time period, so he's seeing, Isaiah is seeing beyond um, what we would know, what we say is the um, tribulation period. He's seeing into the millennial reign of Christ. And Jerusalem, Israel, will be rebuilt. And that during that time of Israel being rebuilt, nations will come to support Israel while they rebuild their, rebuild their system, <laughs> rebuild their country. And that people will, you know, watch your flocks. People will take, be, uh, be uh, watching over uh, watching over you and be assisting you rather than being destructive to you. <laughs> so uh, it's not like uh, today. Some people blame uh, Israel and the Jews, Jewish people for all the problems in the world, you know. <laughs> it's still going on. It's, it's, it's amazing, you know. Oh, well, anyhow. Do you have any questions? So what we see here is Isaiah looking down the corridors of time in these chapters he is not only talking about the coming of the Messiah you know Isaiah also writes that a virgin shall conceive you know so you know I like to do that point in history Isaiah sees where Jesus is coming you know he'll be born and um, you know he'll be a suffering servant um, but then in this verses the, the verses that we previously read some of what Isaiah see, sees goes to that pinpoint or that point, and then some of what he sees is still out in our future, which is the after the tribulation period and is the, is the rebuilding of Jerusalem during the millennial reign of Christ. So that's out there. That's another pinpoint. So one's in our past, 2,000 years ago, Bethlehem, and somewhere out in our future is also what Isaiah is writing about. So if we challenge and say, well, that's really not true. Isaiah is just, you know, figuratively speaking. Well, then what do we do with his figuratively speaking about Jesus and, and his birth? And uh, a virgin shall conceive, and you're going to call his name Emmanuel, God with us. And what do you do with all of that? <laughs> so. Got an answer for it? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so moving on. Um, one of the things that I, I wanted to mention is all God's people will become priests and ministers, and each would have direct access to the Lord. Now believers are encouraged to come boldly to the throne of grace with no human um, intermediary, intermediary. So Isaiah talks about, I mean, Think about when Isaiah wrote this, that everything was on the priest system, priestly system. You know, you had the priest that did the sacrifices. You had the priest that um, offered the sacrifices to God. They ran the temple. And, you know, everything was done around the priesthood. 
Well, Isaiah says, that's not going to exist anymore. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's, that's heresy. You know, Moses put this into existence. Moses put this in place right from God. But Isaiah says, well, that's true, but there is coming a time in which every believer will be there, be priests unto the Lord, offering their sacrifice of praise and offering themselves as a living sacrifice to God. So the priesthood of all believers is a New Testament concept, but it was written about by Isaiah, <laughs> you know, hundreds of years before it ever happened. And, um, you know, if uh, they really got serious about it, they would have gone in and killed him right then, you know, because he's doing heresy. So. Amen. Thank you, brother. Preach it. So. Yeah. Right. I don't know. You know, it, it, yeah, he, he may not have, but it's like, well, uh, well, sometimes I say things I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> Where did that come from? <laughs> but, um, you know, there again, a revelation. Well, it's just like John in the book of Revelation, you know, he, he didn't, he only could write down what he saw or thought, you know, the, what he was, what he was thinking. And, you know, how do you write about missiles and bombs and Apache helicopters? And, you know, how do you, how do you write about that? <laughs> right. The same with John in Revelation. There were things that God said, you just kind of put this, put this under your hat. Same thing with Paul. God, you know, there were things that he just had to, you know, that he just had to, that was his, and for his own, uh, for his own, uh, his own personal experience. And then in chapter 61, verses 8 and 9, and this is the everlasting covenant, and of course that's not written out, so uh, the everlasting covenant. That's because I am the Lord and I love justice. I hate stealing and everything that is wrong. So I will give the people what they deserve. I will make an agreement with my people forever. So what he's doing here is that he, his children living right and doing the right in this world, that Jesus admonishes them to, um, that they are to do the right thing and keep doing the right thing. And we have in the New Testament, uh, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So we are looking at how that God is putting together um, that his reward is for those who do the right thing. Uh, the Lord says that he will enter into an everlasting covenant with us. <laughs> an everlasting covenant. So God is entering into an everlasting agreement that is initiated by him as his seal of the Holy Spirit uh, on it, and that we are his forever, that um, he will make an agreement with them. Then verse 9, their descendants will be known throughout the earth, and everyone will know their children. Whoever sees them will know that the Lord has blessed them. So, um, that um, he is pleased if we will follow him and perform good works for, for, the good, for good ends. We will come to love the truth, and the Lord will reward us for our faithfulness. If obeying him causes us to suffer at the hands of evil, he will bring us to joy and fulfillment. Uh, Paul said, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Then verse 9, um, the text says the followers of Christ will be recognized in such in, in, as such among the nations in the midst of the peoples so the people in the again in the in the millennial kingdom those who are doing right will be recognized for their efforts <laughs> you know it's a lot different in our, you know today it's you know whoever gets ahead by whatever means they want you know but uh, god is saying that he will recognize those and people will be recognized for the good that they have done so 
then there is the invitation in the second part of Isaiah 62, which is the invitation accepted or rejected. So the invitation for Christ. Uh, verse 10, 11, and 12. Um, the easy read version says, Come through the gates, clear the way for the people, prepare the road, move all the stones off the road, raise a flag as a sign for the nations. And so what, he, what the, the, the idea is that when the king is coming, <laughs> you know, the king's highway, you know, they always sent out... Um, when the king was, you know, going to visit a certain part of the country, whatever, the Romans especially, they, had their, they built their roads, that the slaves would go out and uh, they would, you know, take down the hills, the mountains or the hills, and fill in the valleys, and they would get all the stones out of the way and, you know, make sure that the road was smooth. Well, um, the, the uh, prophetic light, the picture of the Messiah is already... Um, has already come, he's on the, 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 is it where the king's highway, and he says, move all the stones, listen, the Lord is speaking to all the faraway lands. Tell the people of Zion, look, your Savior is coming. He is bringing your reward to you. He is bringing it with him. In verse 12, his people will be called the holy people, the saved people of the Lord, and you, Jerusalem, will be called the city God wants, the city God is with. So, um, so when the Messiah arrives, um, he has, his message is, uh, Isaiah sees it as something that's going out to all of the earth. You know, it's, it's a message that is broadcast, that the, the Messiah has come, he's, he's entered the city, Jerusalem is the joy of God, and the, the nation of Israel is the, the, the people of God. And then we move to... Um, well, let's read here, it says, What a change in status Jerusalem and the nation of Israel will enjoy when the Messiah comes. Instead of a place that no one sought after, this place shall be called, called the sought out. <laughs> so Jerusalem will be this, you know, in our, in our thinking, it's the focus of the, it's the center focus uh, of, of the universe. You know, if, this was something we said years ago. I, don't, never, I haven't heard it said a, a lot anymore. But in the center of Jerusalem is the United States because it says J-E-R-U-S-A. <laughs> L-E-M. So in the center of Jerusalem is the United States. So whatever the, whatever the, um, I guess I'm going back to whatever the, the political atmosphere in the U.S. Towards, um, towards Jerusalem, when the time comes, we pray that we are ready to stand by God's word and be, um, be seen as uh, friends of Israel, because God promises to bless those who are friends of Israel. Um, in Isaiah chapter 65, the obstinate people, <laughs> we don't have any of those in our society. There's no obstinate people. It says, verse 1, Isaiah 65, I am sought of them that ask not for me. The face of the rejected. The Lord called out to the people who had not sought him and offered the joy of salvation to them. So God, it's... The picture that some people present or have in their mind that God is against anybody that's, you know, that doesn't like him or isn't, that's against him. Well, it's not really true. God is for everyone. And that people in their sin are blinded by their sin and they, you know, they are against God, but it doesn't mean they can't be turned. And uh, so we pray for them to be turned, <laughs> that the veil... Uh, their blindness would be uh, taken away that they might see what is before them. He says, I am found by them that sought me not. I said, behold, behold me, behold me unto the nations that was not called by my name. I'll read it in the, in the um, easy read. It says, 
I helped people who had not come to me for advice. Those who found me were not looking for me. I spoke to a nation that does not use my name. I said, here I am, here I am. All day long I stood to accept those who turned against me, but they kept doing whatever they wanted to do, and all they did was wrong. They keep doing things right in front of me that make me angry. They offer sacrifices and burnt incense in their special gardens. <laughs> they sit among the graves waiting to get messages from the dead. <laughs> you know, you want to, you know, don't, I don't know, I'm, I, I, I think of people who, you know, these, there are people that you can call in, talk to them, they'll talk to your relatives, you know, that are dead. And, and Israel, the, you know, and Isaiah is saying that this is, this is what people are doing <laughs> in our time period. It's not in the dark ages of history, but in, in our dark ages, that people sit among them and try to get messages from the dead. They eat the meat of pigs. <laughs> Their uh, pots are full of soup made from unclean meat. But they tell others, don't come near me, don't touch me, because I am holy. <laughs> and they are like smoke in my eyes, and their fire burns all the time. So um, Isaiah is, you know, really, you know, calling them out and telling them, uh, telling it like it is for, you know, the time period. So we have both of this contrast going on. You know, we have the, the good of what God will do in rewarding. And then there, at the same time, there's these other ones that God is, you know, right before him. And I think of it in the sense that people in their, I don't know, in their arrogance, that God is there and they just refuse to accept him. And they do whatever they want to do uh, that is uh, against God and against his word. And then we have uh, verse, verses in 65, verses 8 through 12. Um, the, what's listed here is verse 11 and uh, 12, I believe. So it says in verse, um, verse 8, Isaiah 65, 8. I want to make sure I have the right verse. 2, 5. I guess I start with six. Look, here is a letter that lists all your sins. I will not be quiet until I pray, pay you back for these sins. I will do it by punishing you. Verse seven, I, the Lord, am doing this because your sins and the sins of your ancestors. They did these sins when they burned incense in the mountains. They shamed me on those hills, and I punished them first. Then verse eight, the Lord says, when there is new wine in the grapes, people squeeze out the wine, but they don't completely destroy the grapes because the grapes uh, can, be, can still be used. I will do the same thing to my servants. I will not destroy them completely. And whenever we're looking at this, the judgment, was, uh, the judgment to come was pronounced on the entire nation, but the faithful will be spared what he's, Isaiah is talking about here with the chosen people, that those who are faithful, even though there's a judgment upon those who are uh, sinful, the faithful will be spared. And I will keep some people of Jacob, verse 9, some of the people of Judah will get, will get my mountains, and I will choose the people who will get my land. My servants will live there. So he's declaring that the, the, uh, the righteous, those who have done the things that God wants, they will be spared in the judgment against the wicked and that those who have done the right thing will be the ones who get to get the reward that God has to offer, meaning the mountains and the land that he will give it to them. Then verse 10 is, Then Sharon Valley will be a field for sheep. The valley of Achor will be a place for cattle to rest. All this will be for my people, for the people who come to me for help. And then verse 11. But ye, but ye are, I'll read the other version. But you, people, you, but you people left the Lord, so you will be punished. You forgot about my holy mountain. You begged to worship luck. <laughs> you held feast for the false god, fate. <laughs> I 
that was pretty a different way of stating that verse that you um, you 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 worship you began to worship luck <laughs> it's good fortune and uh, you feast at the, the 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 false god fate and so whenever whenever you think about those types of situations you know we we sometimes think that it's luck <laughs> No, good fortune is because everything good is something that comes from God. Every good and perfect thing is a gift from God into our life. And Isaiah is, say, is seeing this, and th that the, 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 those who are being punished, that the righteous will be spared. And he uses it like the, the grapes and, and you know, being squeezed but not destroyed. So there's, there's good that God is going to uh, prevail with. And then... Um, those who walk in disobedience, the great day of judgment, they will be reminded of how they forsook the Lord and neglected his house. Verse 11, that they will see how their God, they have forsaken God and neglected all the good things that God had offered them, especially in their um, relationship with him and the things that pertaining to God, they will be judged for what they have uh, left out. And we have verse 12, but I decided what would happen to you you will be killed with a sword you will all be killed because i call to you but you refuse to answer me i spoke to you but you would not listen you did what i said is evil and chose to do what i did not like <laughs> so um isaiah is telling them you know you're going to be you're going to those who break god's commandment will be punished those who follow god's leading in God's commandment, will be rewarded. And Right. That's a good, um, si the good word. <laughs> Simultaneously. Simultaneously, as he is bringing out judgment, he is bringing out rewards. So those who are being punished will be punished, and those who are being rewarded will be rewarded. And as we talk about being the priests, uh, that each believer is the priesthood of all believers, is that we can offer our sacrifice of praise and our trust in God you know, for what God will do in our life and what he is continuing to do. So simultaneously, <laughs> when, the, when the wicked are being punished, the righteous are being blessed. And if you go back to uh, in Egypt, whenever the plagues, the plagues were upon Egypt, but they never crossed the barrier to the children of Israel. You know, you know how, how do you have... You know, it's like, how can this happen? You've got the swarms of bugs and locusts and everything, and they're on one side of the line, and on the other, there isn't any. You know, the line of demarcation, it just isn't there. The, the, well, just like the uh, death of the firstborn, the blood of the lamb that the, the angel went through, and whoever didn't have the blood of the lamb on the doorpost of their homes, uh, they were killed. But those who did, firstborn child was killed. And then uh, to those who had the blood, passed over so simultaneously good good word dear <laughs> oh well then i take it back Yeah, all of eternity, you know, while the, we are with God in heaven, uh, in the new heaven, new, new earth, that there will be those who are in everlasting punishment. Ugh, don't want to be there. And then Isaiah sees uh, the everlasting joy for God's people, the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, chapter 65, verses 17, uh, 18, and 19. Now, if you, can, if you read in the, uh, in the book of Revelation where John writes about the, you know, that 
the old earth and sky, they all just go away like a, a garment rolled up like a, a scroll, and God creates a new heaven and a new earth. Well, Isaiah says, I am creating a new heaven and a new earth. The troubles of the past will be forgotten. No one will remember them. <laughs> My people will be happy and rejoice forever and ever because of what I, because of what I make. I will make Jerusalem that is full of joy, and I will make her people happy. Then I will rejoice with Jerusalem. I will be happy with my people. There will, my, there will never again be crying or sadness in that city. <laughs> exactly what John writes. <laughs> you know, John writes those very same things. And in, his, in the revelation that John receives, the revelation that Isaiah receives, is they come from the same... You see, this is what is so unique about the Scripture. What's so unique about it is the Holy Spirit is the revealer, and the same prophets and priests and individuals, apostles and so on, that write this are, are receive the inspiration from the same person, the, the Holy Spirit. So God is revealing himself to the authors, and that's why it's a, you have all these different authors, but it's the same theme, because they received the message from the same person. And in our lives, we have the person who inspired the, the writings of these texts is the same God that inspires us, wisdom and revelation, to read them and to make application of them in our lives. I hear the amens echoing through the TVs. <laughs> um, obst obstinate people. <laughs> oh, I don't know any of those. Uh, chapter 65. I already, I already did that one, right? Yes. Chapter 65, 17, 18, and 19. Yeah, read that. And then verse 21. Yes, and to the days of God's people, verse 21. In that city, whoever builds a house will live there. What he's talking about here is that the rewards that we have will stay with us. That, you know, no one's going to take it from us. There will be no mortgage to have, you know, second mortgage and uh, reverse mortgages. <laughs> There'll be <laughs> no taxes. <laughs> uh, and they build a house and they inhabit it. In the city, whoever builds a house will live there. Whoever plants a vineyard will eat the grapes from the, from the garden. They'll reap the benefits of their labor. Never again will one person build a house and another person live there. Never again will one person plant a garden and another eat the fruit of it. My people will live as long as trees. My chosen people will get full of whatever they make. So he's talking about the, the lifespan in the, in the New Jerusalem, you know. Somewhere it says, uh, if you live to be 100, you know, right, being 100 will be, you know, if you die at 100, you think you're cursed because, you, because the long life, uh, you know, in the Old Testament, going back to Methuselah and all those guys. So living a long time will be uh, the uh, norm rather than the exception. And then verses uh, 23, never again will a woman suffer childbirth and have her baby die. Women will not fear childbirth. I, the Lord, will bless all my people and their children. I will answer them before they call for help. I will help them before they finish asking. Wolves and little lambs will eat together. Lions will eat hay like cattle, and snakes will eat, dust, eat only dust. They will not hurt or destroy each other on my holy mountain. That is what the Lord says. So in this new Jerusalem, in this new kingdom, in this um, dwelling place with God, thousand-year millennial reign, that we have what has taken place, that God has, you know, um, the lion will lay down with the lamb, the child will play on the snake's den. Uh, you know, it's going to be a total place of peace. And then the conclusion of this 
Isaiah writes about a time coming on this earth that will be better than anything that has been since the Garden of Eden. For the righteous, a glorious period is coming. For the unrighteous, divine judgment is lurking. After a period of unparalleled peace, engineered by Christ himself, we know that at the end of the thousand years, Satan is loose for a period of time, and he will mount a rebellion against God. And then will come the great white throne judgment. God will put that rebellion down. The heaven and earth will disappear. All the, un, um, all the unrighteous, all those who uh, have not been raised to new life, uh, raised, resurrected from the dead, all the uh, wicked will be raised in a resurrected body, and they will stand before God at the great white throne judgment, and they and Satan and all of them will be cast into the lake of fire, and God will create the new heavens and the new earth. Isaiah writes about it. <laughs> John wrote about it in the New Testament, and uh, Jesus spoke of it. <laughs> but he speaks of it in the term that I have come that you might have life, and you might have it more abundantly. So that's Isaiah, and as the more prophetic say, Isaiah, and uh, <laughs> next week we're in uh, Mark, so Jesus' ministry begins January 24th, wow, any questions? Too bad. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings of your word. God, you promised that you would give us wisdom and revelation. God, we thank you for such unfailing devotion. And God, the closeness that Isaiah must have felt been with you to receive such a word. And Lord, we thank you for his life and the example that it is to us. We thank you for the word that you spoke through him. We pray that it will be light to our path and, Lord, strength to our lives as we serve you, that even in the midst of turmoil, God, you preserve the righteous. So we are grateful for that and ask you to guide us, guide our nation, guide us as individual and as the body of Christ, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.